What's up, everybody? Dorn Aldana coming at you again with another kick-ass episode of the Art of Mortgage Marketing podcast. And today we're going to talk about seven habits for highly successful LOs of highly successful LOs that allow them to win in any market, not just a fair weather market. So this, it really is like the holy grail of success, right? To be able to win in any market, not just a fair weather market. But, you know, you know that there are lots of different loan officers, mortgage brokers, mortgage bankers, and all these salespeople for mortgages on 100% commission all have access essentially to the same products, the same rates, right? It's a level playing field. So why is it? that the top 1% income earners earn 10 times, at least 10 times the average loan officer. The average loan officer makes around 75K a year, and that's before tax, not after tax. The top 1% income earners make over 10 times that, like three quarters of a mil and up. So what do they know that you don't? What did they do that you don't. That is the million dollar question, is it not? Now, obviously, success can't be measured simply in monetary terms. That would be way too myopic, right? Success is more than just zeros and commas in our bank account. We know people, I'm sure you know people, who are successful monetarily, but they don't have a life worth emulating, right? Their health is in shambles. Their relationship is a shit show. Their relationships with their spouse, their significant other, their kids is not something worthy of emulation. They may be in strife, stress, anxiety, fear, overwhelm. They may be a miserable person. They've got lots of money, but they're miserable. They may be completely out of shape. There's lots of different aspects to success than just monetary. So just looking at a top producing realtor doesn't necessarily mean that they're successful. As Jesus wisely said, what good is it to gain the whole world, but to lose your own soul? So we need to have an expansive view of what success means. We can't just be myopic and look just simply at volume, units, closings. There's more to success than that. You know that. I know that. If you're rich monetarily, but poverty stricken in the soul with stress, strife, sickness, selfishness, sleepless nights, etc., that can't be defined as success. Agreed? So having the wrong definition of success and having that be the marathon we're running and the focus of our lives that we give our talent and our time and our life energy to can easily have us run the risk of climbing up a ladder only to find out once we get to the top of the ladder that it's leaning against the wrong building. That is not what we want to live our life for. There was a great definition given for success by the late and great Earl Nightingale, I still remember the timbre and the cadence of his wise voice. He had such an incredible voice. And his definition of success is the progressive realization of a worthy ideal. Isn't that a beautiful definition of success? The progressive realization of a worthy ideal. Now, that begs the question, how do we know if it's worthy? How do we know if something we're going after is a worthy ideal? Well, there's lots of different different definitions of what worthy might be depending on the specific personality and their ambition and their background and their values and what's important to them. So you could easily ask someone like Hitler, what's worthy? And they'll say, well, let me rule the world and let me make my people my genetic people be the ones who oppress and suppress the people who are lesser than. Let me take over the world. Let me have power. Let me make a better world by having these lesser thans be oppressed and suppressed by the better thans. That obviously would not be a worthy ideal. But in his mind, it was a worthy ideal. Same with Bernie Madoff. He had a worthy ideal of getting rich 
on other people losing their life savings, on a sham, on a scheme that was raping and pillaging innocent victims of their life savings. That obviously would not be a worthy ideal. So there's something about worthiness that is inextricably linked with having a positive impact in the world, serving others over serving self. So if we use that as the context, the other thing that we want to look at is it needs to be something worthy of you. Like, don't ask, what are you worthy of? That would be way too small. That would be not a life worth living. It's too small. Rather, ask, what's worthy of you, your time, your energy, your talent, your legacy? I submit to you that something that's worthy is something that serves others over self, but it also is you living your best life, leaving your best legacy. It's serving others over self, and it's having you living your best life, living your best legacy. That is a great definition in my mind of what a worthy ideal is. And had Madoff or Hitler had that as their definition of a worthy ideal, had that as the focal point of their ambition, the world would be a different place, right? If everyone in the world had that as their worthy ideal, this would be heaven. It would be heaven on earth. People blessing people, serving people. Obviously, that's not the life, the world we live in, but we can be those light warriors who shine light in the darkness who live this life of benevolence and impact and service. And that's what we're called to be as far as I'm concerned. That's the message that we preach. That's the beat that we drum. We drum that beat like a cheap rap song all day, every day here on Planet Prosper. It's all about being light in the darkness, being a difference maker and making the world a better place. Yes, you might call yourself a loan officer, mortgage broker, mortgage banker, But at the end of the day, you're here to solve problems, to make someone's life better, to help them achieve the dream of home ownership, build generational wealth through the power of real estate, and you help that become a reality for people. You get to be light in the darkness for people, making people's lives better. So with that in mind, I'm going to reconstruct what you may have preconceived and presupposed were the traits of highly successful LOs. Because inside of this context of success being about a progressive realization of a worthy ideal, it changes the game in terms of what examples do we want to emulate? And being that I've been coaching mortgage pros to success for almost 20 years now, two decades, you know, I'd have to be a complete moron not to notice a few qualities, characteristics, rhythms, routines, habits that the upper echelon of income earners that are actually fulfilled and happy and have a life worthy of emulation, which are few, you know, admittedly, they are few and far between. They, they're, they're not, you know, everyday people. They're extraordinary. They're remarkable. But that's the whole reason why I'm doing this message today is to shine a light on the path of what it looks like to be remarkable, to be extraordinary to be an example worthy of emulation. And so I have a unique perspective, being that I've been on the front lines in the trenches with my feet in the street, working with mortgage pros to help them create breakthroughs and seeing people who struggle and seeing people who are phenomenally successful and fulfilled and creating a great life for themselves and their family, creating a legendary legacy. And I've noticed there's some things they do that the average loan out officer The average mortgage pro doesn't. Success leaves clues, as Tony Robbins says. So without any further ado, I'd like to share with you what these seven habits are. Okay, The first habit is purpose over profits. Purpose over profits. Now, what do I mean by purpose? There's lots of different purposes. The definition I give to a purpose is a purpose that's connected to serving another. A purpose that goes beyond just serving your own needs to serve someone else's needs. So for example, a top producing elite of elite successful LO, they tend to be, if they're fulfilled and they're not just self-seeking, 
but they have a benevolent purpose. They're purpose driven. They have more of a focus on family served than they do profits earned because they know if they will make the impact, the income takes care of itself. If they transform lives, the transactions will take care of themselves. So they focus on family served versus profits. They focus on lives transformed over transactions closed. Notice that's a purpose-driven mortgage professional that's purpose-driven from the heart, not from the head, but from the heart. And from that place, you can create relationships. You can have relationships that have deep roots. You can build trust because it's based on virtue. It's based on character. Victory is always inextricably linked with virtue. And when you fall short of virtue, then you shift from being a victor to being a victim. And that's the beginning of the end when it comes to living your best life, your blessed life, a life worth living, let alone leaving a legendary legacy. So victory is always grounded on the solid foundation of virtue. Now, a benevolent purpose will always be more powerful and more fulfilling and more profuse with peace and joy than mere pursuit for profit. If you're just pursuing your own profit, that's a small life. If you're on a mission to make an impact, to change the world one client at a time, one family at a time, that's a magnanimous mission that will animate you from the heart with a purpose from the heart. And people will feel it. They'll feel your caring. They'll feel your genuine connection to purpose. And that makes all the difference in the world. You're, you're going to do way more to serve a magnificent mission like that than you will to serve yourself. Now, you want to be ambitious with this. That's another thing that comes with elite of elite performance and impact and being remarkable is they don't think small. They think big. If you're going to think, you might as well think big, right? Most people don't shoot too high and miss. They shoot too low and hit. They have way too little ambition. They say things like, I want to be you know, realistic. I want to be reasonable. That's a great way to be mediocre, by the way, is being realistic and being reasonable. If you want to be realistic and reasonable, go back to getting a J-O-B. Go back to punching a clock, working nine to five and nine to five prison. That's a great way to be realistic and reasonable. You're not in this business to be realistic and reasonable. You're not in this business just to get by and make do. You're here to make freaking history, true or not true. So elite of the elite, top producing, top 1% income earning mortgage professionals that are worthy of emulation, they're ambitious for impact. They're ambitious to have an impact in the world, to make a difference, perhaps even being industry disrupting, where they want to disrupt the whole industry in their town, in their city, in their state, in their province. They want to make an impact that makes a difference, a positive difference in people's lives. Not just getting by, not just making do, but making freaking history. Notice that's a much bigger vision. And then they break it down into bite-sized pieces. So it's achievable. They take a big mountain of an ambitious, big, hairy, audacious goal and vision, and they break it down into bite-sized pieces. So again, we want to have connection to purpose. We want to be ambitious for impact. And we want to be all about serving others versus serving ourselves. Purpose-driven versus profit-driven. And when you focus on serving other people, the profits take care of themselves. As long as your margins are dialed in, obviously that's another part of your business skill you need to dial in is making sure you have solid margins, rein in the expenses, but it's connection to purpose that has you unleashing that innate genius and to have you soar as the eagle that you're called to be and capable of being, living a purpose-driven life. So the second uh, habit of highly successful LOs is growing over getting. So if you're taking notes, that's the second one to write down. Growing over getting. You see, if you look at how you approach your business, 
there's a dichotomy. There's two sides of the equation. It's a duality. You can look at the challenges in your life and say, this is happening to me. I feel so sorry for myself. This sucks. Why does this always happen to me? You know, why is this always got to be a reoccurring problem in my business? Rates going up. Realtors not going to the time of day. You know, having a shortage of inventory, having these headwinds blowing in my face. Why can't it be easier? Why can't these realtors be more loyal? Loyal. Why? Why can't borrowers be more loyal? They waste my time. They get a quote and then they go to their bank or they go to some other lender. And so there's that perennial stream of suck that we can focus on, right? We can poke, we can poke the poop. We can sniff the poop. We can inspect the poop. We can p- complain about the poop. There's always crap in our life that we can focus on. True. On the flip side, we can look at that crappy, stinky stuff in our life, either as unwanted, undesirable, and just feel like a victim. Or we can say, hey, this would make mighty good fertilizer. This stinky crap. This is great for growth in my garden. Let me repurpose this crap to create hyper growth in my garden. And all of a sudden you shift from it happening to you to it's happening for you. This isn't happening to me. This is happening for me. Notice the shift. You're embracing the challenge. You're embracing the suck, the stinky stuff. And now you're using it to be a blessing in your life. You're using it to be rocket fuel in your rocket. No pressure, no diamonds. No fester in the flesh of the oyster, no pearl. You see, every adversity has the seed of equal or greater opportunity, the late and great Napoleon Hill once said. And that's so true, is it not? If you look back at your life, the times you've grown the most, you've had the most transformation, you've become the virtuous best version of yourself with a solid, strong foundation where you grew soul strength from the inside, that came not in lollipops, unicorns, and rainbows, sunny skies seasons, but in the challenges, in the shit storms of life, in the dark night of the soul, in those seasons. True? It's like that saying I heard, that strong timber does not grow with ease. The stronger the wind, the stronger the trees. So, Highly successful LOs, the ones worthy of emulation, the ones that win in any market, not just a fair weather market, they see themselves as the best investment they can ever make. They're reading books, they're listening to audiobooks, they're listening to podcasts, they're ferocious learners, insatiable learners. They always want to be growing. They understand and live out and embody the Kanai principle, constant and never ending improvement. They're just always wanting to get a little, get a little bit better, just a little bit sharper. They're never too cool for school. They're always ready to show up and learn something, empty, empty their cups so they can learn something. They have humble hearts. And they're also in the habit of getting comfortable being uncomfortable. They're used to swimming upstream. They're comfortable being uncomfortable because they realize that all the good stuff is on the other side of their comfort zone. That's the spout where all the good stuff pours out, outside of their comfort zone. It's like everyone wants to be rich, fit, and happy, right? Everyone wants to be fit, rich, and happy. Most people are fat, broken, unhappy. Why is that? It's because most people don't like getting out of their comfort zone or not willing to get out of their comfort zone. They want it to be easy. They know that it's rare to be rich, fit, and happy, but they figure they're going to be the rare exception who can do it while staying in their comfort zone. They may not think that logically, but if you look at their actions, that's what the presupposition is that's driving that behavior. Chances are unconsciously, unwittingly. But the elite of the elite get comfortable being uncomfortable. They're in the habit of taking risks. They're in the habit of feeling the pain, feeling the resistance, feeling the excuses, feeling the discomfort, and doing it anyways. No risk, no reward. And the growth that they get is always outside of their comfort zone. That's the growth zone. That's the fulfillment zone. Fulfillment is always going to be outside of our comfort zone. We have to swim upstream against the current of our excuses, against the current of average, against the current of our own propensity to coddle our comfort zone and to shrink back to our comfort zone. 
but the elite of the elite, they have the habit of taking ownership, no blaming, no complaining, no excuses, no pointing fingers without. They realize that when they point fingers without, there's three fingers pointing back at them, right? So they have extreme ownership. They have that mantra, if it is to be, it's up to me. They don't blame, they don't complain, they don't make excuses. That's the mindset of a champion. The third habit of highly successful LOs, LOs worthy of emulation, is feedback over failure. They have a different relationship with failure. The average person, they hate failure because they see it as a demerit on their record. It lowers their status. And it all it it reminds them of the inadequacy syndrome they already have in their own head, the imposter syndrome story they already have in their own head. So it confirms and affirms the lack, limitation, and scarcity story they already have in their own head. So they try and avoid anything that would have them feel less than, that would lower their status, that would have them feel inadequate, that would have them feel like a quote unquote failure top producers and the elite of the elite, the champions, the leaders, the world changers and the impact makers, the industry disruptors are the ones who start off with imposter syndrome. Like I can tell you, I've had so much of my story be riddled with imposter syndrome, feeling inadequate, feeling not enough, but they don't stop with that story. They say, you know what? I may not be enough, but with God, I'm more than enough. They usually have a faith beyond themselves. They usually believe there's got to be something behind this universe. It can't be the result of some mindless accident. They usually have a connection to source, to God, that has them get out of themselves and trust in something bigger than themselves, to have something supernatural add the super to their natural such that they're willing to expand their paradigm about themselves. They realize God doesn't make any junk. He doesn't start with them. And so they allow God to expand their perspective. Now, obviously not all elite of the elite top producing loan officers worthy of emulation are people of faith. But what I've noticed is most of them tend to have a faith in a power, spirit, God, bigger than themselves. And what that allows them to do is to see failure differently because their safety now is their, in, a, in their identity in God. Their safety is not in their bank account. Their safety is not in their performance. Their safety is not in how many awards and recognition they got from their company or from the industry. Their safety is not in how many loans they close or their pipeline or their commissions. Their safety is baked into their soul and their identity in God. And because of that, they know they're fearfully and wonderfully made, made for a special plan and a special purpose. And when they have a solid foundation that is secure, no matter what storms may hit, it allows them to have the safety to take some risks. It allows them to have the security in their soul to take risks where failure is no longer failure. It's feedback. It's another opportunity to start again more intelligently. And you see that in the world changers through the ages, like Thomas Edison, the one who invented the incandescent light bulb. It's been said that he went through 10,000 so-called failures to create the incandescent light bulb, but he wouldn't call them failures. They were just different iteration different tests, different experiments to find out what didn't work. So we got more information on what would work. It was all part of the process. Abraham Lincoln, did you know that he failed eight times at the polls before he became president? And he failed twice in business. Think about all that failure. Could you imagine failing eight times at the polls? Eight times in a row before he became president. That's a lot of failure. Michael Jordan, He didn't even make his high school sophomore team. Think about that. The greatest of all time basketball players usually have a story riddled in failure and defeat, but they don't let that defeat define them. Sly Stallone, Rocky. Did you know that he was so broke trying to pitch his idea for Rocky? 
He didn't have enough money for dog food. He had to sell his dog. He was homeless and was so broke. Broke as a joke, he could not afford dog food. And he had 30 rejections for his idea before he got someone to say yes. And then they wanted to just pay him uh, $300,000 for him to play in his own movies. Like, screw that. Actually, no, they didn't want him to play in his own movie. They wanted someone else to do it. And he was so broke, he could have easily taken the offer and say, you know, I'll take the 35,000 bucks, you know, and just, he could have caved, but he didn't. He was true to his vision. And now, of course, he's a household name because he remained true to the vision. So much so that he had enough money to pay the guy who he sold his dog to, to get his dog back. Amazing story. I don't have time to talk about it now in full blown, but the point is failure is a key to success. Failure is part of forging our soul and forging our mind and forging our character and forging our skill and our knowledge to be able to become the person we're called to become, to stand on top of that dream that's in our heart. There is no obstacle too big for the committed. When you're committed, there's always a way. When you're interested, there's always an excuse. There is no failure too big for the committed. They always find a way. They go around it. They go over it. They go through it. They go under it. There's always a way when you're committed. So for the elite of the elite, they have a habit of not seeing failure. It does not compute. It's just another opportunity to start again more intelligently. And Thomas Edison had a great quote for this. He said, most of life's failures didn't realize how close they were to success when they gave up. They were literally just three inches from gold. They were just so close. They didn't realize how close they were to winning when they quit. That's why quitters never win and winners never quit. Now, we want to have intelligent testing versus delusional optimism, though, right? Because it's easy to play the ostrich and say, oh, I know that I've been doing this for 10 years, heading east looking for the sunset. I know that what I've been doing has not been working. But if I just keep doing this, heading east looking for the sunset, eventually I'm going to see the sunset. No, that's not how it works. That's not accurate thinking. That's delusional optimism. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over, expecting a different result, which is why you have to keep tweaking keep testing, keep trying different approaches and keep trying different things until you find something that works. That's one of the reasons why Smart Ambitious Growth Minded Mortgage Pros hire us at MortgageMarketingCoach.com because it's painful to try and reinvent the wheel. It's painful to try and reiterate and create something from scratch. Why do that when you just get the recipe for what works right out the gate? That's how you condense decades into days. Why reinvent the wheel when you don't have to? You can just get the recipe for the champion level cookie and you get champion level cookies right out the gate, right? It's like instant access to what works. So that's a huge part of what top producers and the elite of the elite, highly successful LOs invest in is proven systems, formulas, and recipes so they don't have to reinvent the wheel. The fourth habit of highly successful LOs worthy of emulation is they have a habit for system doing over self doing system doing over self doing what do i mean by that well when you look at your business you've got marketing tasks you've got sales tasks and you've got operations tasks marketing tasks are all tasks designed to generate leads once you have a lead then you move to the sales tasks those are all tasks that are designed to move a lead from being just a prospect to being a client, right? And then, of course, the operation tasks take everything from the lead to the app to the closed deal. And once you get them under agreement and you're in process and you're getting documentation and checking credit and all that stuff, that's all operations tasks to get the deal closed, right? So your business can be broken down into those three categories, marketing, sales, and operations. Now, once you build a team and you have a team of LOs, then you have got recruiting and you've got higher level leadership stuff. But if we keep it simple, just for the typical LO, those are the three categories we're looking at. Now, if you just do the task yourself, you're basically like a guinea pig on a diamond studded, golden plated guinea pig wheel. You might make more money. You might make greed money but you're still a guinea pig on a glitzy guinea pig wheel. You're not free. 
the way to create freedom and to scale your business to seven figures and beyond while working 20 to 30 hours a week, if that's your desire to have that freedom that autonomy, that independence to do what you want, when you want, with whom you want, anytime you want, is to invest time to work on your business, not just in your business. Because if you just work in your business, then you have a glorified job trading time for money on the time for money treadmill. Now, if you're cool with that, that's off to you. Have at her. But if you want real freedom, if you're here to create real freedom, you've got to set aside time to work on your business, not just in your business. And a really powerful question to ask is how can I automate, systematize, and streamline this process? As you're doing what you're doing, whether it be taking an app, whether it be checking credit, whether it be collecting docs, whatever it is that you're doing, ask yourself, how can I automate, systematize, and streamline this process? And as we're about to talk about, delegate this process. Because if you can systematize it, it's a lot easier to delegate. If it's just in your head, you're dead because you're just going to tell them what to do. They're not going to do it. And you're going to be screwed, blued, and tattooed. They're going to fumble the ball and you're going to be back to square one doing it yourself with the mantra. If you want it done right, you got to do it yourself. Sound familiar? So you've got to create a system. That's the difference between McDonald's and Bob's Burger Joint. Bob's Burger Joint down the block might make $200,000 a year in revenue versus McDonald's that does like 40, million, 40 billion plus in revenue. And it's managed by pimple popping teenagers. How is that possible? Because it's undergirded with policy, procedure, protocol, and systems. And because it's so airtight in their operations, procedure, protocol, and policy with playbooks, it makes it easy, breezy, lemon squeezy, relatively speaking, to be able to delegate each step. And that's why the burger tastes the same, regardless of whether you're in Pennsylvania or Toronto or Timbuktu. It's all the same burger because it's airtight with those proven playbooks. So you want to create playbooks for the different aspects of marketing, sales, and operations. And another big reason why smart, ambitious, growth-minded mortgage pros hire us here at MortgageMarketingCoach.com is they want the playbook for the most profitable part of their marketing so they don't have to reinvent the wheel. And that is how to get top producing realtors to make you their exclusive without the hell of begging, bribing, or kissing butts or cold calling. Because let's be real, that process sucks unless you know how to make it profitable and make it fun and make it fruitful. And usually the things that are fruitful that have you feel powerful because you're getting such amazing results, those things are fun, right? We always gravitate towards the things that we're good at, that we're powerful at, that we get results at. And most people are not good at attracting top producing realtors because that is a very difficult code to crack. That's a difficult needle to thread. And that's why people hire us is to learn how to become powerful where they feel powerless in many cases. And that is the single most, that's the shortest path to the cash to making freedom money in this business is building a stable of say seven to 12 top producing realtors who send you all their business all the time, sending you one, two, three deals a month. That's all you need. Seven to 10, seven to 12 top dogs and you're making freedom money. No need to do it the hard way. No need to take the long convoluted route. No brownie points at the bank for doing it the hard way, right? All right, moving on. The fifth habit of highly successful LOs is making heroes over being the hero. So if you're taking notes, write that one down. Making heroes over being the hero. You see, it's not just about self aggrandizement where they are the one on the stage and they get all the rewards and recognition. Sure, that's cool, but they have a deeper motive. They want to help other other people achieve their dreams. They don't want to just achieve their dreams. They want to help other people achieve their dreams. They don't want to just be the hero. They want to make heroes. They have a servant's heart. They have a servant's heart. That's what true leadership is, by the way, having a servant's heart. There's a great teachable in the Bible about the uh, disciples of Jesus asking, you know, can you give me a high place in the kingdom of God? Can you give me a privileged place? And he was like, guys, you're getting it all twisted. This is the upside down kingdom. This is not about you being the greatest. This is about being the least and how you become the greatest is being the least. How you become the greatest is become the greatest servant. To be the greatest means being the greatest servant. 
And so highly successful LOs worthy of emulation have a habit of servanthood, serving their clients, serving their partners, serving their team, helping them achieve their dreams, their goals, their full potential. And one of the reasons why they build a team, aside from the fact that they love making a difference in people's lives and they love the opportunity to scale and make a bigger impact through the efforts of others, the time of others, leveraging other people's time and talent, because there's only so far you can go in your, with your own time and efforts. You're going to hit that bottleneck, right? Where you hit your glass ceiling. There's so many, so, so many hours in the day and then you hit your limit. So if you want to scale, you need the power of team. T-E-A-M. Together, everyone achieves more. Together, everyone achieves miracles. But what's beautiful about this is where you are weak, someone else is unique. What that allows you to do is build a dream team. It's like the Navy SEALs. Everyone's got their specialty, right? One is a bomb specialist. Another one's a sniper specialist. Another one is a specialist on the machine gun, the 50 cal right? They all have specialties. One's a medic. And so you build a dream team by having specialists in their respective zones of genius. That way you can dance in your strengths by getting other people to dance in their strengths by delegating your weaknesses. So you can do what you do best and get the best to do all the rest, right? How cool would that be to only do the things that light your fire, that charge your battery, that light you up? Battery charging activities versus battery draining activities. Notice how just the idea elevates your spirit. Doesn't it feel lighter? Doesn't it juice you? It it doesn't give you instant joy just at the mere thought of only doing the things you love doing. That's what the elite of the elite do. They dance in their strengths. They delegate their weaknesses. Now, you might be saying, but Doran, if I delegate it, they're going to drop it. Because they don't care like I care. They don't deliver like I deliver. It's just the way it is. That's true. But if you find rock stars, not if, but when you find rock stars with the mantra of superstars only, I will only hire superstars. I'll only hire people who have checked three references on and they have a history of being a rock star. They have a history of doing excellence for excellence sake. The best predictor of future performance is past performance. Superstars only. Now, here's the kicker. If someone else can do it 80% as well as you, delegate it. Because while you're losing 20% by having them only do 80% as well as you, that's still 100% freaking awesome when you have more freedom, more time with your family. They may only do it 80% as well as you, but when you're sitting in the Bahamas in your pajamas, sipping a Mai, Mai Tai poolside with your family, because you've delegated all that minutia to a top talent team member, that's 100% freaking awesome, right? There's a great book by the name of Buy Back Your Time by Dan Martell. Highly recommend that book, Buy Back Your Time by Dan Martell. It is the bomb diggity, such gold in that book. Highly recommend it. So you want to build a dream team and support them to live their best life. That's what the elite of the elite do. They create a culture of success, a culture of growth, a culture of community, a culture of constant and never-ending improvement. And they lead by example. They are the example, the living, breathing example of what it looks like to live that culture out. Because truth be told, as soon as you build a team, your people are going to do double what you do wrong and half of what you do right. So if you don't lead by example, I promise you, they won't be doing it. You have to lead by example every day. The first hire might be a virtual assistant, otherwise known as a marketing assistant or marketing concierge to help you launch, manage, and maintain your marketing campaigns. The second hire that you have might be an LOA. The third hire might be maybe a loan partner or processor or underwriter. Fourth hire might be an operations manager, or maybe you're ready to build your sales team with loan officers. Now, as you're building your policy, procedure, protocol, and systems, a great tool to teach people what to do and how to do it is useloom.com. That's one of the absolute best tools, Google Docs and useloom.com. It's a free app. It's a Chrome plugin, and it allows you to record video demos explaining every step in your policy, procedure, protocol in your playbook. So each phase of 
what you want to delegate, you can now delegate easily using useloom.com. You're welcome. That's a very, very, very powerful little tool and it's free. Now, the sixth habit of highly successful LOs, if you're taking notes, is purchase partnerships over refi waves. Purchase partnerships over refi waves. What do I mean by that? Well, you and I both know after two years of rates going up and refis basically drying up, that the purchase business is the only consistent, reliable source of business. That's the only real reliable source of bread and butter. And the elite of the elite top producers know that to be true. So they see refis as just gravy on top, the cherry on top. It's just a bonus. The bread and butter is purchase business, purchase business, purchase business. That is the business. Refis are just a bonus. So what they do is they focus on forging partnerships with top producing realtors because they understand that top producing realtors in a challenging market like we're facing right now with hyper competition, margin compression, everyone and their dog chasing after the same realtors and inflation and all the rest is the top dogs are the ones who are least and last affected by market downturns versus first and most. The top dogs are the least and last affected. They're the most insulated. And they're the ones that tend to take market share in a challenging market like this. While their competition, the part-timers and the struggle bunnies are dropping like flies and going back to selling solar or driving Uber, going back to nine to five prison. So top dogs take market share in down markets. And that gives you security when you hit your wagon to those guys versus the struggle bunnies and the part-timers and the mediocre middle. So that's why they make that a mandatory must. They're always cultivating relationships with top producing realtors. And they're making that the main thing because the main thing is to keep the main thing, the main thing. You feel me on that? I'll tell you what, that one trait, that one habit is an absolute game changer. That's how they win in any market as opposed to just a fair weather market. Now, last but certainly not least, the seventh habit of highly successful LOs worthy of emulation is they focus on leading metrics over lagging metrics. What do I mean by that? Well, leading metrics is like the top of the funnel. Lagging metrics is like the bottom of the funnel. Leading metrics is like the sowing season. Lagging metrics is harvest season. So if you look at all the metrics in your marketing, the one that you have the most control over is going to be the leading metrics. Leading metrics are things like appointments set, outbound calls made, live connections made, appointments booked, new VIP partners signed on, maybe leads generated, referrals generated from those partners, maybe pre-approvals generated from those leads. Those are all leading metrics. They're the metrics that you have the most amount of control over. Conversely, lagging metrics are the bottom of the funnel harvest season metrics that you don't have as much control over. Like you can't just snap your thumb and have a closing. There's seeds you need to plant and then water and then fertilize before it takes root and bears the fruit of a closing, right? You can't just snap your thumb and produce volume. Volume comes from closings. Closings come from a lot of incubation, a lot of follow-up, a lot of nurture. So that's why the elite of the elite worthy of emulation focus on leading metrics instead of lagging metrics because it gives them the focus on what they can actually control, the locus of control, what they can control versus what they can't control. Because a sure way to frustrate yourself and to feel overwhelmed is to try to control what's outside of your control. That is not wisdom. Wisdom is to focus on what you can control, to be in the driver's seat versus the passenger seat. And that's why the elite of the elite worthy of emulation, have a daily habit of prospecting. We call it the hour of power, where they're reaching out to prospective partners. They're always building a pipeline of new partners. They're always cultivating relationships with their existing partners, and they're attracting new partners. And they're building that stable because there's always going to be attrition. There's always going to be people that are no longer the right fit. We need to bless and release them. We need to do it a monthly or quarterly team enema and flesh out some dead wood that's no longer in alignment, no longer synergistic. And so rather than just standing still and sitting on their laurels, they're constantly growing and prospecting. So they have a daily habit 
with their hour of power of pro- proactive prospecting. And of course, they're going after the top producing realtors versus the bottom feeders. So there you go. There's your seven habits of highly successful LOs. Which one or two or three do you need to work on the most? You may need to go back, listen to this again. We have this in not only Facebook Live version, but we also have it uh, as it gets released live to the public in podcast version on YouTube. And so you're going to have access to these trainings. If you are watching this on YouTube, please subscribe. If you're watching this as a podcast, please subscribe to this podcast. If you dig it, please give us a review. Review us on iTunes and or Spotify. Give us some love if you feel we're worthy of it. And if you're watching this, you're listening to this, you're like, Dorn, I'm picking up what you're putting down. I'd need me more of those success habits, but I need more importantly, some accountability. I need an expert in my corner with a proven plan so I don't have to reinvent the wheel. I, I like the idea, Dorn, of condensing decades into days. That sounds like an intelligent move. I'm, I'm all about getting to the outcome. I don't need all the pain to get the gain. I want to get the baby. I don't want to have to go through all the labor pangs, at least not as much as I would if I'm trudging on this path on my own. I want someone in my corner to support me, to unleash the greatness I know I'm called to and capable of. If that's you and you're on 100% commission, you eat what you kill with no safety net, you make 70 basis points or more, and you want to make at least an extra $100,000 plus per year in the next 12 months without messing around doing it the hard way. And you know that if you can just lock in on five to 12 top producing realtors and you one, two, three deals a month, it's game over. I mean, stick the fork in it, bring the barbecue sauce, it's done like dinner. If that's you, I invite you to take advantage of a complimentary breakthrough call where we lift up the hood on your business. We look at what's working, what's not working, where you're at now, where you want to be. And if we can help you get to that, you know, that next level with our support, we'll show you what that looks like. If not, we'll be the first to advise you to pass. But either way, our goal for that call would to illuminate you with clarity, clarity like you've never had before, to give you massive clarity, massive value, and chances are we're going to have some fun. So if that sounds meaningful and worthwhile to you, book a call at mortgagemarketingcoach.com forward slash apply. Again, that's mortgagemarketingcoach.com forward slash apply. Well, that's all we got for today, friends. Thanks for hanging with me. My name is Dorn Aldana coming at you from the Art of Mortgage Marketing podcast. I challenge you to put these habits into practice in your life, in your business. Focus on one. Once you get that plate spinning, move on to the next plate. Just focus on one habit of these seven habits over the next seven months, one habit per month, and see if it doesn't change your life forever. Because once you own the habit, it owns you. And when you own healthy healthy, wealthy habits, you can't help but have a healthy, wealthy and illuminated successful life. And that's my prayer for you is that you are the light in the darkness, that you make a difference in other people's lives, that you are an example worthy of emulation, and that you leave a legendary legacy of love, leadership, and impact to be light in the darkness, to make a difference in the world. So let's be on this journey together, shall we? I'm looking forward to being locking in arms with you as a fellow soldier of light to make this world a better place. And I promise you that if you will pursue mastery in these five or rather seven success success habits, that you will find that you will have more energy, more life, more joy, more peace, but more importantly, you can have more fulfillment because you're going to know that you're going to light up someone else's world. You're going to make the world a better place, but first lighting up your own life by being that example. I hope I've been that for you in some way today. Be blessed. We'll see you on the next episode. Peace, y'all. Thanks for being with us.